today's meeting is is on um let me share my slides got a, a very brief presentation Ooh, i don't seem to be able to find it no worries um so it's it's about stochastic control and their interplay with um um data science stochastic control historically um started to gain traction and and and, and you know being developed in the mid late 60s um at the time most of the applications came from engineering then in the late 70s we had um a further development of of, of the field thanks to several applications in mathematical finance and i think it's fair to say that, that nowadays stochastic control has um grown quite substantially it has connections with mathematical analysis probability and stochastic analysis and there is a wealth of theoretical results um, and widespread applications um, across several sectors particularly uh, the financial sector and what we've observed uh, in in the recent years has been a, a, an incredible growth of um, data driven algorithms which affect virtually um, all areas of of science and you know we we deal with them in in many real life situations so the this is sort of the um where we we come from in terms of um planning and organizing this meeting we we essentially curious to discuss with experts in the field uh, what are the possible interactions between um applied probability and the, the you know the, the the traditional stochastic control approach and the new uh, data driven um algorithms and what are the challenges and potential mutual benefits from uh, bringing these these two things together and our, our first speaker today is uh, Sam Cohen. Sam, are you here? Hello. Hi, Sam. Um, so Sam, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to introduce Sam Cohen, who's Associate Professor at the Mathematical Institute of the University of Oxford. Oxford. Um, Sam uh, did his PhD at the University of Adelaide in Australia under the supervision of Robert J. Elliott. And, and then he went on to hold various positions in, in, in different universities in, the, in, in Australia, in France, and then, and then mainly in Oxford. Uh, he's an expert. He's been working on um, backward stochastic differential equations, filtering theory and stochastic control. He has a book. He's a co-author of a book on, 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 the, on stochastic control. But today he will uh, tell us about learning and uh, making decisions through time, which I think is one of his most recent uh, research interests, where there is, a, you know, sort of stochastic control and, and 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 data science come together. So, if you could please, Sam, share your slides. You've got 35 minutes, and then, as I said, we will have five minutes at the end for mainly technical questions. Okay. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah, looks People good to me. Slides? Excellent. OK, well, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, uh, of course, it's it's a pity we can't see each other in person. Um, I see various friends in the, the list of participants, and it would be great to see you if we could. But here we are. So what I'm going to talk today is about um, questions of what happens when you try and put statistics and control together in interesting ways. In particular, if I had to put a subtitle, it would be how does statistical uncertainty make itself felt in control problems? So what I'll talk about is based in part on joint work with Tanit Tritan Diblet, who's a doctoral student of mine, uh, who's particularly been working on multi-arm bandits uh, with uncertainty and in various other situations. So to begin with, I'd like to start with a toy problem, which sort of highlights where the problem with statistical uncertainty really arises. So uh, we'll think about a very simple situation. We are going to bet on the toss of a possibly unfair coin. So we flip the coin once. Heads, I'll give you a pound. Tails, I'll give you nothing. I supply the coin. You pay to play. And the question is, what are you willing to pay to play my game? Well. If you've met me, you'd know that this is an unwise game to play because I'm potentially untrustworthy. But what I'll do is I'll be reasonable and what I'll do is I'll throw the coin 
uh, before we play. And you're allowed to watch this coin being thrown. Now, I may be untrustworthy, but I'm also not very skilled at throwing coins. So you can be reasonably confident that these are IID samples. There's nothing strange going on there. So you've got IID observations of this possibly unfair coin. You observe at end times. What's the maximum you're willing to pay? So if you're, let's go back to when we teach first year undergraduate statistics, uh, classical frequentist solution, it's fairly straightforward. There is only one sensible way to estimate the probability of heads uh, from IID tosses of a coin, which is you count how many there are, you divide how many, how you divide by how many tosses there were, and this gives you your sample average p hat. Now this has a sampling variance, which we all know. It's p times one minus p all divided by n, the number of samples. So then let's say we have some loss function. Without loss of generality, let's assume that the loss of not getting any money is zero. You can think of a loss fun function or a utility function. But then if we have one of these, we can calculate the estimated expected loss from playing the game or gain from playing the game. And you see this is p hat times the gain you associate with one pound. This is the estimated expected loss. It allows us to calculate prices. What's a little surprising at first glance is that the variance of p hat doesn't appear. This solution has you being completely indifferent as to how well you know the value of p hat. Um, well, p hat approximates the value of p. So now we have a problem. Suppose I could choose between two coins, or you could choose between two coins. The first one I throw three times, and suppose you observe two heads. The second you throw 3,000 times, and let's suppose you observe 2,000 heads. Which coin do you prefer? Well, the majority of people, when you ask them, seem to prefer the second coin. They understand that coin better. They've observed it more times. And most people still prefer the second coin, even if you say uh, you throw it 3,000 times and you observe 1,999 heads. Now, this is inconsistent with the estimated expected loss. We've got a lower probability or the same probability, but you have a strict preference for the latter coin. And it seems one of the reasons is that you prefer the uh, coin that you have better knowledge of. Well, maybe the problem is that we haven't put P, the unknown probability, in part of as part of our probabilistic framework. So let's attack this using a Bayesian argument. So now we'll write Fn for the sigma algebra generated by our observations. Then we can go through and we can calculate uh, what's the conditional expectation of the loss given our information. And we use the tower rule. We expand by saying conditional on P and Fn. You then say, given P, all my tosses are IID. So it's P times the loss associated with one. You then notice the loss associated with one is a constant. So that comes out of the equation, and we just get the expected value. So the posterior variance, the estimate of how accurately we know P, still doesn't form part of this valuation. And this is true for any rule based only on the posterior law of X. You can go and do the calculations if you like. Effectively, the posterior law of X is determined by the conditional expectation of P, not by the variance of or the conditional variance of p what that means is this is not valuing accurate knowledge of p which people seem to do in practice so what i want is a way of trying to understand how we could associate a value to having knowledge of p in this example or more generally how can we associate a value with precise statistical knowledge because this seems to be something that people have, and so it might make sense to include it in our framework. Now, one way to do this is to use the mathematical formalism, which is known, it, it's, it appears in various guises in all sorts of disciplines. Um, one of them is to describe this as a nonlinear expectation. So what is a nonlinear expectation? Well, particularly we'll look at convex expectations. These are maps from bounded random variables to the real numbers, which are in some ways like 
the regular expectation we're familiar with. In particular, they're monotone. If you have two random variables and one is always bigger than the other, then that should be reflected in the expected values between them. They're trivial and equivariant on the constants. That means for any constant k, the expected value of k is k. And if I take a random variable and I add k to it, the expected value of the random variable plus k is the expected value of the random variable plus k. Now, this would be a regular expectation, except instead of saying this is linear, we're going to assume only that it's convex. So for any psi and psi prime, any lambda between 0 and 1, we have the usual convexity relationship between the, with the expectation. Now, this is a way, this convexity is going to try and capture our preferences against uncertainty. Well, if as soon as I tell you something's convex, uh, if you've done much convex analysis, the natural thing that you want to do is you want to dualize it, use the uh, legendre fenchel duality for convex functions to see what the dual problem looks like. So we can describe a convex expectation through its dual. Let's assume a little bit of continuity, so some lower semi-continuity here. Then we have a representation that the expectation, or the nonlinear expectation, the convex expectation of psi, is the supremum over all equivalent measures Q of the expectation under Q minus some penalty based on Q. So this is taken over all possible probability measures. We'll assume absolute continuity for simplicity so that we're not focusing on the analytic details. Now, if we do this, what you can see is that alpha describes how reasonable Q is in some sense. In particular, if alpha takes only the values zero and infinity, then this says, uh, let's look at a smaller family of measures, those where alpha is zero, and take the worst case expectation under the, that smaller family of measures. More generally, alpha could be a smooth function, in which case we're penalizing models Q that we think are really not so good as models for our random variable. Now, this is a mathematical formalism, but it can describe uncertainty, at least in the abstract. So what we have is a class of models, Q. We have a measure of how reasonable or how unreasonable they are, alpha. And what we do is we compute expectations under all these models, and we combine the expected value and the unreasonableness in a convex way to obtain a nonlinear expectation. And so using this formalism, our nonlinear expectation depends not just on a single model, but on a trade-off between how reasonable a model is on the one hand and how big the expected value is on the other. Okay, so far this has been abstract nonsense. It's just formalism about uh, mathematical operators. So let's give some concrete suggestions. And what we're going to try and do today is we're going to use alpha to connect our nonlinear expectation with statistics. So what does alpha represent? Well, as I've said, alpha in some sense describes the unreasonableness of the measure Q as a model for our data. So we're trying to say, is Q a sensible distribution for whatever is generating these random variables? But in classical statistics, this is a familiar concept. The negative log likelihood is an object which describes how reasonable a model is. That's why we maximize likelihoods, we minimize the negative log likelihood. That's finding the most reasonable model. And so we're going to use that connection to try and build from statistical observations a way of penalizing our expectations, put them together and see what happens. So let's suppose we have a family of absolutely continuous probabilistic models, Q, so this curly Q is the family of all our statistical models we might consider. And we're going to assume absolute continuity so that we have a nice likelihood function. And these should describe the distribution of our observations, which I'll just denote Xn, and our yet to be observed outcomes, the size that we're interested in. So L, curly L, is the log likelihood against some reference measure. 
And then using the log likelihood, we can define a divergence function, so Bregman divergence if you prefer that terminology, which is the negative log likelihood of Q uh, evaluated with my observations Xn. And then I'm going to add to that the maximum value. So I'm going to renormalize alpha just to make its minimum value zero. Now, if we assume an MLE, maximum likelihood estimator Q hat exists, then we can simplify alpha is the negative log likelihood of Q against the best fitting model. So this is saying we're using the log likelihood that captures how bad a model Q is, and the reference case is going to be the MLE, the best fitting model in my family. Okay, so once we've done this, we've got our divergence alpha. I'm going to generalize very slightly by saying, let's divide by K and then raise this to a power gamma. And that's just a useful way of expanding the range of things we're looking at. So we then define what I call the DR expectation to be the maximum over all our models of the expectations of psi given my past observations, minus this penalty, which is a rescaled version of the negative log likelihood. So what do these K and gamma actually do? Well, K has to be a positive number. It describes the scale of uncertainty aversion. If I have a big value of K that reduces the penalty, it means I'm very averse to uncertainty, while gamma describes in some sense how curved my expectation is. It's going to change, do I think models nearby are as good as the best model, or do I think that uh, I have a smoother change as I move away from the best model? Um, including gamma and K gives an interesting family, um, and the cases that I'm usually interested in are when gamma is one, so I'm just penalizing by the log likelihood, or when gamma is infinite. In that case, uh, this is this penalty is either zero when uh, one over k alpha is less than one, uh, or less than or equal to one, and then it's infinity when uh, alpha is more than one, or one over k alpha is more than one. Uh, dealing with the case when it equals one in this way just makes the duality a little simpler. So what's dr? Well, when I was trying to write this paper, I first of all described this as divergence robust because we use the divergence to build this uh, expectation. Then I realized that in terms of sales, uh, it's always better to use the word data. So let's call it the data-driven robust. Uh, you can choose which acronym DR refers to. Okay, what's an example of this? So let's do the simplest example, which as we know, when we do basic estimation, we often go to the Gaussian case as everything's easy. So let's suppose that all my observations, x1 through to xn, and my new random variable x, they're all IID Gaussians, uh, n mu 1, and mu is not known. Well, then we can go through and we can calculate. We know what the log likelihood is in this case. It's a quadratic. And we can see that the expectation of beta times x is the supremum of beta times mu, supremum over mu. So this is my expectation under a model associated with mu. And then I penalize that by how far mu is from the sample mean. Now in the two cases I mentioned, when gamma is one or infinity, this simplifies. So I get beta times the sample mean plus k over two variances of beta times x bar if gamma is one, or root two k times the standard deviation of beta times x bar if gamma is infinite. And so you end up with these two special cases, which you look at them for a moment and you realize they're actually familiar. Um, when gamma is one, this is the same as the exponential utility. It's you're adding a multiple of the variance. Whereas when gamma is infinite, this is what we teach regularly is confidence intervals. You take the sample estimated mean and you're adding some number of standard deviations of the sample mean to it. And you're looking at the biggest case. So it's the top end of the confidence interval. Okay, so what happens more generally, we can see the Gaussian. Let's think about what happens when I go to a large sample theory. So when our number of observations is large, it would be nice to know what happens. So uh, it would be nice if everything's fairly familiar. 
we might ask, do we have consistency? Do, does this expectation converge to the true mean uh, under in probability p for all values of p in my family? We'd also like a central limit theorem type result. Does everything in some sense degenerate into the Gaussian case? So let's focus on the case where x and the observations are all assumed to be iid and my random variable of interest is just going to be some function of this iid copy x. So let's also assume that q is a nice family of measures. So we're going to look at a parametric theory here. So for example, we could have an exponential family. Here are the densities in natural parameters theta and a is the log partition function. Uh, it's a convex function. I'm going to assume a little bit more. I'm going to assume that the information, this is the Fisher information, uh, that it is strictly positive definite and that an MLE exists and is consistent. Well, if we have this and we assume that the map from the parameters to the expectation of phi of x, remember phi of x is the random variable I'm interested in, I'll assume this map is differentiable. Well, if it's differentiable, I can differentiate, and it's useful to define what I, you could call the local variance. So it's a, an approximation of the variance. In particular, if phi happens to be a linear function of the sufficient statistics, then you can see that the local variance is the variance under theta hat, under the best fitting model, the MLE, of phi of x. On the other hand, if uh, theta hat n, so the MLE after n, let's assume that had the variance that comes out of the central limit theorem. So in particular, the variance of theta hat n is one over n times the inverse Fisher information. Then you could see that one over n times the local variance is approximately the same as the variance under the true model of the expectation using the MLE. So this is just classical likelihood theory to get these out. With this local variance, we can now give an asymptotic result. So suppose that my map from uh, parameters to the expectations is twice differentiable. Let's assume phi is bounded and measurable. Then for the cases when gamma is one or infinite for a fixed value of K, we can see that the expectation or the nonlinear expectation in the case when gamma is one is equal to the expected value under the MLE model plus some multiple of the variance plus is small in probability. Similarly, when gamma is infinite, then we have the expectation under the MLE model plus the square root of the local variance, some multiple of it, plus something which is small in probability. And the proof of this is fairly straightforward. You approximate the penalty, the divergence alpha using a quadratic. Uh, you show that this is a good approximation and then you use basic calculus to get everything out. More generally, there's an elegant connection to likelihood intervals. So suppose the MLE is consistent and Wilkes theorem holds for every P in my family of models. Wilkes theorem, we remember, tells us that the asymptotic log likelihood has a chi-squared distribution. Then if I define this interval, but given by my convex expectation on, for the upper value, and then if I put two minus signs in it, that gives me a lower value. This interval uh, will be a likelihood interval, which is effectively a confidence interval for the, con the true conditional expectation. And in fact, it has a nice uniform property that the probability that this um, conditional expectation is in this observed interval for every possible psi, this probability is bounded by the probability that my divergence is less than or equal to k, which by Wilkes theorem asymptotically has a chi-squared uh, distribution. So you can actually quantify exactly what this probability is. So this approach shows the following. It's one way of connecting our, our statistical estimation with our valuations. And for large samples, it corresponds with fairly familiar ways of dealing with uncertainty, incorporating information from the sampling distribution of our parameters, not just the distribution of the outcomes. 
So we know something about the model that we're using and how that modeling is influencing what's going on. Confidence intervals come out uh, naturally in this setting. There's no reference to hypothesis testing, which is how confidence intervals usually arise, um, but we can justify them in this way. And we have good behavior of this expectation for multiple random variables. So what happens when we apply this in a stochastic control problem? So we've seen how to value outcomes accounting for our uncertainty, but how does that affect decisions? So a classic example uh, is a multi-armed bandit. So you have M machines which you can play. You don't know the distribution of their costs. When you play, you face a random cost, but you learn about the distribution of the outcomes from the machine that you've played when you play it. So you need to decide how to trade off between exploring, trying different machines, and exploiting playing the best machine. And these are used as toy models of many different problems. So a great advance in this area was made by Gittins in the 70s. And he said, well, suppose the payoffs depend on an observed Markov process, for example, the Bayesian estimates, and that they're independent, so between the different machines. Then he constructs a dynamic allocation index, which is a predictable process such that the best strategy, minimal expected discounted cost, is to play the machine with the smallest index. And since then, many extensions have been studied. So we can try and make the result precise. We have the costs G, which depends on my choice rho. These are random costs. Then uh, Weber's formulation of Gittin's result is, if I define a random variable gamma, this isn't the same gamma as before, which is uh, the solution to this optimal stopping problem where you subtract gamma, to force the optimal stopping problem to have value zero. Then if I solve this optimal stopping problem, then the strategy which is minimizing gamma gives the lowest expected discounted cost. And you can see the discount factor beta coming in. So Kelly and many others noticed that when beta goes to one, this rule degenerates to something simple, which is choose the bandit where you've seen the least number of losses or equivalently, slightly different formulation, you take a confidence bound on the expected return of each bandit with the lowest confidence bound. Now in the computer science community, they flip it upside down, they look at rewards rather than costs. Agrawal and others proposes the upper confidence bound algorithm, which tweaks the confidence interval slightly in terms of how big they are, and then proves some asymptotic performance bounds. But overall, we get the weird conclusion compared to what we had before, that you should prefer to play uncertain machines. And if we remember at the beginning, we said people generally have a preference against an uncertain outcome, at least when we're going to play the game once. So what happens when we try and put our uncertainty and our multi arm bandit problem together to see how these two interact? Well, we run into some problems with time consistency because when you've got uncertainty aversion, generally speaking, you are not going to have time consistency. A dynamic programming principle does not apply. Why is that? Well, the classical expectation is recursive. You can define a conditional expectation so that the tower law holds. Coherent expectations, that's the same as my convex expectations, but we're just going to restrict to the zero infinity case. They're recursive for every filtration, only if they are linear or the worst case, almost sure worst case expectation. So that's not very interesting. You can't capture uncertainty aversion and capture the expectation uh, in a consistent way at the same time. Now, if you have reconsivity, then you get a dynamic programming principle. But in the multi arm bandit problem, our controls determine the filtration. They determine what we see, what we learn, and so we can't presume consistency. The fact that we are learning and making decisions which affect what we learn changes our problem quite a lot. And so the earlier optimality condition of maximize the, consist the expected value is too strong. But there is a way out. We can use an indifference valuation perspective. So this is suppose that for each set of costs, we're just going to add some cash. And we'll say that this cash is a compensator if at time zero, uh, the random costs subtracting my cash benefit has zero expectation. And at any subsequent time, they have to have non-positive expectation in every state of the world. 
if a particular row has a lower realized uh, cash cash flow than every other um, than every other possible row, so one choice needs the least amount of cash to compensate, then we say it's C optimal. The classical setting, we can show that C optimality exists by the Martingale optimality principle. Generally, C is not unique, but you can defy, derive a backward induction algorithm to compute a possible C. And if you have a recursive expectation, which does satisfy dynamic uh, consistency, classical optimality and C optimality align. Uh, classical optimality implies C optimality and the other way up to the addition of some predictable endowment. What about robust bandits? What happens when I use this theory for bandits? Well, let's suppose our bandits are independent and we give ourselves a consistent, coherent expectation, not for all the bandits, but for each bandit separately. We then take these, we say everything's independent so we can combine them into one coherent expectation. And once you've done this, the kittens index, by solving this optimal stopping problem, you can show that it is C optimal. So we can solve this, this optimal stopping problem. It's a quasi-linear free boundary partial difference equation, uh, which you can solve numerically. The proof of this uh, optimality is quite fiddly. You've got to be very careful about how the filtrations interact, but it can be done. So to finish up, let's see what this actually means. So let's analyze our problem numerically. Let's consider a very simple setting our machines either return a cost of zero or one, so they're like my coin toss at the beginning. We'll say, let's suppose we play for 2,000 periods and we'll have a discount factor, which is very close to one, so we're almost not discounting at all. But each time, we're gonna learn like a Bayesian. So we're gonna be updating our probability. Um, it evolves like a Bayesian estimate with implied initial sample size one, uh, we infer credible intervals. They're like confidence intervals. This is the same as what we'd get out if we use the DR expectation um, using the conjugate beta prior. And then what we'll do is we'll paste them backwards to force some backward recursion, just to add some consistency along each bandit separately. What we're interested in is how much more, or well, what's the Gittins index, the compensation you need to play this bandit, versus the estimated probability. So if this quantity is negative, that suggests that you are risk loving or uncertainty loving. You're exploring the system. You're playing uncertain machines because you like to learn. Now, if we go through and do this, this is the sort of thing that happens. So this is when you've got relatively low uncertainty aversion. You can see that here's one over the square root of the sample size. Here's the estimated probability, and here is the Gittins index minus the probability. So if this quantity is negative, that suggests you want to explore. And we can see when our uncertainty aversion is low, so this K here represents the uh, width of the confidence interval or the, the probability associated with it, then you see basically this thing is negative, which suggests you like exploring, you particularly like exploring when P is close to a half, which is when the variance is highest. So when you're really uncertain about uh, your bandit, then you like to play that more than you would just for the probability. What happens when I put high uncertainty aversion there? Though? If I raise the uncertainty aversion by widening the confidence intervals up to 95%, then what I find is that basically you don't like playing uncertain bandits. The uncertainty aversion is dominating the learning term here. Now, there's lots of different parameters you could play with. We could also say, what happens if you discount the future very strongly? Well, if you discount the future, if I don't care about what happens tomorrow, I don't need to learn because learning doesn't help me today. It only helps me tomorrow. So if I discount the future strongly, I end up with this picture where I get positive values of gamma minus P, which tells me you don't like uncertainty. On the other hand, if I said, let's suppose I only had a short time to play instead of a discounting problem, then again, you end up with uncertainty aversion. When you only have a short time to play, you, you're not interested in learning. 
Finally, you can get very weird things when you sort of balance all the parameters together. And here you see an example where you get both negative, so uncertainty loving, and positive, uncertainty adverse regions. And they're not symmetric. It's that when you think the game is good, so that's a low value of P, a low chance of a loss, then you become uncertainty loving. When you think the game is bad, then you become uncertainty averse. Now, in either case, when your uncertainty diminishes, we move along this line, we get a high value of N, then your uncertainty preferences disappear almost entirely, as you'd expect. So in conclusion, there are weird and interesting connections between what happens when you're learning, when you're uncertainty averse, and these probability distortions. What happens when you change the probabilities? Um, uncertainty aversion can bring statistics into optimal control in novel ways. This is not simply a Bayesian partial observation problem anymore. Um, parametric and non-parametric approaches are possible. I didn't talk about any non-parametric theory today. Um, the opportunity to learn will counteract aversion. And this is where these two ideas, one being uncertainty aversion, one being the ability to learn, they interact they, they fight against each other at least some of the time. Now, I'd also like to point out uh, these things are often dynamically inconsistent, but there are some optimality criteria we can use which addresses the inconsistency in useful ways. So it's common when you introduce uncertainty aversion uh, that you get inconsistency, and very interesting challenges arise, even in simple cases like a multi-armed bandit with everything independent. It's a, a difficult problem to analyze, so a lot of fun as a mathematician. OK, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Thank Sam. You, Sam. Um, um, so there, so is, there time is time for a few, for a few technical, technical questions, questions, if there are any from the audience. If you could please um, raise your hand. OK. If there is Alex, I think you raised your hand. Hi, Sam. Thanks for that. Hi, Alex. You mentioned, so when you're talking about these compensation payments, you said there may be non-uniqueness. Does that cause an issue or is, I mean, can you say something about that? So there's a sensible way to define them, but what happens in these compensation payments is it's possible to trade off late compensation for early compensation. So we can't prove that there's a unique compensator. They're sort of, they're fairly restricted though, because you need them to be predictable, you need to have zero value initially, and you need them to compensate uh, or super compensate at every point in time. So they, there's quite a lot of restriction on what you can do. There's an obvious way of choosing them, but we haven't managed to show uniqueness or figure out what a sensible uniqueness criterion would be. So, so do you think, you think they might be unique, but you can't prove it, or you think I they think, are? I suspect if you put I suspect there's some weird assumption, which I haven't been able to figure out what it should be. And if you add that assumption on them, then you'll get a unique one. Um, there is a natural way, as I said, there's a natural way of constructing them, which is through a backwards dynamic programming type argument. So you can get an example out that way. That's what you get from the Martingale optimality principle. Uh, but I can't see how to construct it, uh, how, to, how to axiomatize that. The problem is in the multi unbanded problem, you, you want to construct something forward in time, not backward in time. So you, in some sense, try and avoid actually doing backward dynamic programming as much as you can in that setting, because you want to create something you can compute on the fly without solving a uh, multi-dimensional, horrible dimensional PDE. Sure, yeah. Thank you. I think there is a, a question from Simon Tindemans. Simon, if you want to unmute yourself and post the question. Simon? This must be the fix. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yes, OK, sorry. Um, thanks for a very interesting talk, uh, quite far from my usual line of work. So I'd like to ask a, a general question. This, um, the nonlinear expectation that you showed reminds me a lot of coherent risk measures. So can you comment on the connection between these two concepts? They are exactly the same up to a change of sign. 
Ah, okay, right. It's just, Good. Okay. Um, it's just I don't like putting minus signs everywhere, so I work with the nonlinear expectation version rather than the coherent risk measure. But otherwise, okay. they're exactly the same object. Okay, great. Well, that's uh, then I, I really need to read up on this because I I use um, those. Uh, I suppose the novelty the novelty here is that in the uh, the risk measure literature, there hasn't been a lot of thinking about statistics, and here it's trying to bring that estimation perspective into this theory. But Brilliant. formally, Thank you. you're right, they're exactly the same. Wonderful, thanks. Okay. So I guess maybe I could ask a, a, a brief question. This is very basic. And um, so say I have my data, data set, right? And I want to um, somehow compute this um, nonlinear expectation. It, it, so it seems to me that I have to assume some sort of family of models which I draw my P's and Q's from, right? The, the, the probabilities. How would I go about choosing this family? So what I was trying to do here was something very classical. So I assume that we have this family. In fact, here I'm assuming an exponential family of models. Um, which means that I can define the likelihood function. The likelihood is a well, well behaved object. If you want to work with something which doesn't assume that structure, there are ways out there using Wasserstein distances and other related things. They have slightly different behavior. In practice, asking how do I choose this family, it's the same as asking how do I build a statistical model for my data. And once I've built a statistical model, then I know how, well, in principle, how to do estimation in that model, and hence all of this theory would then apply. But it's not a panacea by any stretch of the imagination, but I wanted something quite classical in the framework. I see. Thank you very much. Then I think in the interest of time, we, given that we are on time at the moment, I'll keep it this way. And thank you, Sam, again for your talk. Um, we'll Thank speak you. with you later at the, during the panel discussion. Our next speaker is Beatrice. I can see Beatrice has got her video switched on. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce Beatrice Chayo, who's now a um, professor at ETH Zurich. This is quite recent and we congratulate Beatrice on, on this new post. She got her PhD from the University of Padua and then went on to be a um, postdoc for a number of years in Vienna and until she got, um, I think, a lectureship in, in LSE that then transformed into an associate professorship. And then um, it, it brings us to, to our days. Um, Beatrice has done um, a lot of work on arbitrage theory, model independent finance, and uh, transport theory applied to finance. And um, But more recently, she started also looking at uh, more um, data-driven questions, which will be the, 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 the focus of today's talk. And, and Patricia will be talking about PQ GAN market generator consistent with observed spot prices and derivative prices. So I leave the floor to Beatrice and you can start sharing your slides and um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I have to make a small correction. So thanks a lot for the, the introduction and of course for the invitation. I'm very happy to participate in this discussion. The, the, the small correction is that my PhD was in Perugia with, uh, under the supervision of Walter Schackermeyer, so a bit complicated. Apologies for but, that, uh, sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. Sorry. <laughs> um, so again, thanks a lot for the uh, for the invitation. So I give a, a, a short talk. Uh, so this means that I will not go too much into technical details, but I hope I can give you a bit of an idea of what we are doing with a group of PhD students. And we'll raise more questions than answered uh, during this talk, and hopefully we will have the chance to discuss about them um, later on. So PQGAN, market generator, let's see what, uh, what this is about. So I would like to have a completely uh, model independent view. So I just want to look at, let's look at what kind of data we have in the market, right? So notably we have, of course, a long time series of uh, stock spot prices, Let's say the, we are interested in these stocks. We have prices of derivatives that you observe, I mean, both prices, you know, that we observed in the past, the prices that you observe now. And we have other relevant information, right? We know whether there is something on, going on politically. We know that there is COVID, uh, you know, there is low interest rate or so. So 
we have also other kind of information which is not directly coming from this two uh, above uh, stream of information. What we want to do? Well, we observe all this data and our scope now is to do what is called market generation or prediction. So we want to understand how do we expect now those assets to evolve, right? And pricing. So what now if I have new uh, derivatives written on S, how can I fairly give them a value now in the market? So as I say, agnostic view, so no modeling assumptions, just let's try to understand what can we deduce on the market just by looking at what we observe on it. So maybe very first little observation. I don't know if you can see my mouse. So the first, I put P and Q. So if, like, you know, from the classical uh, mathematical finance background, you would say immediately, well, now here I have information under two different measures, P and Q, right? So I have the stock prices under P, uh, prices of derivative under Q. Well, then actually you can ask you, are taking a completely model independent assumption, what does it even mean to talk of P and Q? So talking of P and Q for me would mean that we can think of P, probability P as any model that would explain what we observe in the market. And we can think of Q as any pricing rule that is compatible with the market prices. So mathematically then trying to understand these two measures, it means that I want to get as much information on the two probability or we can also think, well, I want to get as much information on P and then trying to understand how I change this measure from P to Q, right? So again, I'm approaching this data-driven problem, but with, you know, of course, the approach of mat uh, mathematical finance, right? Of thinking what we usually do, right? We have a P, we want to eliminate the drift. So this is somehow on the back uh, of our brain. We have, of course, some problem already. If I look under P and I say, I want to understand uh, how to, I want to get information on this P. The point is that even if there would exist uh, a precise model that explains what's happening in the market, we observe only one path, right? So how much can we get from it on the underlying possible model that would explain? And under Q, you know, even if I take in mind that from P I want to change to Q, unless I have a complete market, of course, there are infinitely many ways of pricing. So those two questions we can only tackle by rethinking, okay, how do I look at our data? Okay, so this is just a bit brainstorming of what we have. So we have information under P, under Q, how much can we really deduce from the data that we observe in the market about these possible theoretical models explaining that? So the approach that I want to take is what is called generative adversarial network. So I know that uh, most of you, maybe all of you know already. So this is just a baby recall of the concept. So generative, because the final scope is to train a generator G. Uh, what does, well, we want to train the generator to generate real looking samples, okay? So let's forget for a moment about the market, right? The initial, maybe most simple situation to understand guns. We have uh, a set of uh, pictures of um, a cat, and then we want to produce another picture of a new cat. No, I don't want to reproduce the same picture, right? But I want to produce a new picture. How do I train the generator to generate some new picture? I put against him a second player, which is called the discriminator. And the role of the discriminator is to push G to do a better job in that I have here, you see on the on the scheme, the generator would take an element from some latent space and will produce some fake element, right, to the picture of a new cat. The discriminator has the role of getting an input, which uh, they don't know if it is real or fake, and they will have to discriminate, right? They will have to say, is this real or fake? So you will have to recognize. And of course, the better is the job of D in recognizing whether the input is real or fake, the more G needs to improve in order to confuse the discriminator, right? So there is this training those two guys in a loop. Now, in our case, we don't have pictures of cats, we have a market, right? So what does it mean in our framework? Well, ideally, the generator, so what we want to learn, if we want to learn something about this P and Q, or better, how does S, how our assets evolve under P and under Q, so historical measure and martingale measure, and then the discriminator will need to understand, to discriminate, to understand the distance, if you want, between distributions of real data and of fake or generated ones. Okay, so 
main idea is this one. Now, some initial problems. Let's see problem under P. So if I look back here for a moment, so the structure of GAN is based on the fact that the generator has a set of IID samples, right? So this set of picture of cats, right? So we don't have this, right? So even if we just think, forget for a moment about Q, let's just concentrate on the fact that we want to learn the evolution of the asset under P. We don't have an IID sample, right? We just have a long path. What do we do? We can think of chopping, right? And taking some samples, but, you know, we don't have such an art, right, usually. So we will have to think how to solve this. One, for me, crucial thing is to some condition, right? Because then we can think, okay, I have a very long path, but maybe if I want to predict what happened in the next, let's say, NF, uh, number of steps in the future that I want to predict, if I want to predict the next, I don't know, what happened in the next uh, three days, maybe it's enough that I look what has happened in the past week, right? So I will have in mind, so according to the data, to my knowledge, to educated guess, I can think of a number of uh, steps in the past that are enough, right, to justify or to predict what happened in the future, plus some relevant factors, right? I, was in, I want to know if I'm in a stress period in the market, right? If there is some political or economical decision coming. So I can try to make the data not as IID, but, you know, kind of, right? So the first thing is from this information that I have, how do I reconduct myself to thinking that now I have some sample from some distribution that I'm trying to understand, okay? So this means that now we are trying to learn some conditional distribution, right, of the asset S, or if you want of the next, and F steps, given the last and P steps and some factors in the market. So first problem to keep in mind about P. What about Q? Well, about Q, the point of, you know, generating, well, we don't even observe an evolution of S under Q, right? So what do we observe of Q or better of the distribution of S under Q is just some moments, right? Or some, well, we have prices of some options, which means we know some integrals of some functions written on them, right? So here we observe just some moments and from those we want to understand again, a measure, right? Or a conditional measure. So the point here under Q is how much we can learn about this measure. Of course, it will depend on which moments we know, right? So imagine that both now are in the past, we just have in the market vanilla option, like we just observe some all options. Then, of course, the most that we can learn from this about the evolution under Q, if you want, is just marginal distribution. We cannot try, we cannot hope then to be able to price very complex exotic derivatives, which would mean trying to understand how something evolves in time under the Martingale measure, right? So those are, I think, two crucial things to keep in mind as a problem of, you know, learning this P and Q. Uh, again, this is just a short exposition. So let's try to see, to have just a bit of an idea what would this mean. Now, I will talk of P and Q learning, right? Then we will put them together. But so under P, again, I want to learn this conditional distribution. So I can think, well, here I put my conditioning steps, right? N P steps in the past, my factors. And here is an N, I don't even describe, here can be any kind of uh, recursive neural network, whatever network we like, a mixture. But well, I want to concentrate on this architecture, right? That's why here I just put an arrow, because the idea is that, okay, I have some conditioning, then an idea, uh, an architecture that can be used is, now I want to predict, so let's look at the last line. So conditioning on this past evolution of the asset, I want to try to understand the next future steps. And the way I do it, I put this conditioning in, and now here I create some kind of RNN, whatever you want, uh, you know, temporal convolutional network. But let's say, let's talk of recurrent neural network, just have the idea, meaning that here I have noises, so this is my latent space, and from the noise here on the orange, in the middle here, this is our network memory. So I want to put here all the information that is useful also to forecast the next steps steps in the future, right? So here I have this latent value, I have hidden layer, and I have the first outcome, right? So the I have the n preview and p preview steps. This is the next one. Now I want to predict the second one, right? Second step. So I have again the noise, some hidden layer, some information from the past, right? And so on. So this is this 
uh, recurrent neural network architecture, which is, you know, opposed to what maybe often you see, like it is uh, all completely connected, uh, you know, nets. So here we have something where if you look uh, here at the noise, and then here I just have harrows that go up or to the right, right? They can just influence the step at the same time or the next one, right? So I have this generation, right, of, so again, what, what is the outcome here? So given this noise input, I want to train the generator of, you know, to learn under P. I want to train this architecture such that given that I know the previous step, this is, let's say, a good continuation, right? So then this path here now in the last line is a possible conditional path of S, right? So this is from the generator perspective. Now, we want to train this, right? So how do we train it? So how do we improve? Like we can start with initiate with some uh, numbers. How do we improve it? Well, remember there is the role of the discriminator, right? This second person, uh, which uh, role, whose role is to improve this guy, what this guy does. So improving means that I need to understand what is a good distance, right? Between this underlying distribution mu p, right? The distribution of s under p and the distribution that is generated by the generator, right? So here I have the noise distribution and the push forward of you know, this architecture of the generator, right? So the discriminator, in order to tell me, yes, the generator is doing a good job or not, we have to understand the distance, right, between these two distributions of paths. So I don't enter into the detail, also given to time constraints, right? I will uh, uh, consider some, you know, uh, optimal transport-based options. So there are the first uh, way this has been used in the so-called W gun, so Wasserstein gun, which in which the discriminator basically is looking at the uh, distance of two distribution according to Wasserstein. Uh, we have used with um, several collaborator uh, causal transport, and now we are using in this new project adapted Wasserstein. So just towards this causal transport and adapted they look at the distance in a, you know, taking into account time. So if you, if we took the bus ascend distance, right, it means, okay, I have evolution of several assets, right, in time. So let's say the assets, 10 time steps, right? So now I have a huge Rn, right, D times N, and this is where I calculate the bus ascend distance. But you can see that here, I'm not taking into account that one of these two dimensions is time, right? While in the causal and adapted bus design, these distances are exactly between two entities that evolves in time, okay? And this is what seems appropriate to use when I want to calculate the distance, not between two pictures, right, static, but between two path evolution. Okay, so again, what does it mean? How do I choose, even like if I want to concentrate on optimal transport, this can be, you know, just a matter of taste, of course. For me, I would uh, this would be the first thing that comes to my mind. But even so, how do I choose between them? So finally, again, so what is a good distance, right? Of course, it depends on the purpose of the generation. Since I want to look at the market, so financially, I want something that is that tells me, okay, when two models are close, it means that if I look at, you know, utility maximization or pricing or edging, the classical problems, they give similar results, right? So this is our uh, idea. So first of all, as we said before, buses and doesn't even look at the information structure, right? So from the slide before, at least, I would just keep causal transport for adapted buses time. And then of those two, the adapted buses time is the one that actually is robust in the sense that I just say, right? So when I look at optimization from an finance, if two models are close to each other, according to the adapted buses, and then they give similar results. So this is a robustness result that we do want, right? So this would be for me then already a good candidate, right, for the discriminator. Now, once I know what would be the good candidate, if I would have the two distributions, now what do we do in practice? Actually, we would have some mini batch, right? We would have a sample, right, from the market, and then we would generate a few possible evolutions. So it means I have some empirical measures, right? So are they good estimators? And then here, um, for the vast sense, we do already know that they are, but actually for the new distributions, they are not, okay? Problem, actually problem solved, because we have already two ways, either with some kernel smoothing or with uh, what is called adapted empirical measure. So we have a way to 
instead of taking exactly, for example, the empirical measure to modify it a bit and to have something where the answer is yes. So we can indeed look at mini batches and you know have the discriminator calculated distance and be a consistent estimator. A map of these slides, we would consider the adapted vast extent distance and uh, with the adapted empirical measures. So this was for the p-learning, right? So of course we will do the two together, but to have an idea, now what does it mean, the q-learning? So of course many people, they just study, let's say the q-learning, right? They just want to say, I want to do pricing, right? Observe prices in the market. I do some generative adversarial network to forecast new derivative prices, right? But so far we try to keep everything and say, okay, if we have learned the evolution of S under P, right? If we have some approximate for this mu P, then learning this other measure, it means learning a change of measure, right? So unless mu P has, has atoms, there will always be a map that pushes mu P in another distribution mu Q, right? So mathematics is okay, we have to learn a push forward, right? Meaning that if here I give a path of S, now I don't put the details, I want some network that learns a function that pushes the path of S under P to a path of S under Q, right? And then here the discriminator, what does it do? Well, the discriminator, what is the information in the market under Q is the price of derivatives, right? So we calculate the, dis the difference between the observed price of the derivatives and the average of the price that I would get over generated paths. Uh, I still have two minutes, Siano. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I will finish uh, with the remark and the picture. So remarks, of course, now I put just the PNQ learning to have an idea, but you know, optimally, or at least we, this is very much under construction, this work, I should say that. So we are trying several things and we are trying to learn it simultaneously with a unique candle separately. What is very powerful for our algorithm is to in, uh, use this entropic regularization as uh, Perrier and Couturi and, and authors after them, which makes the, uh, you know, the algorithm really, really efficient. We are considering also different loss function, not uh, based on optimal transport. Maybe I skip the challenges, which are just more general challenges, I guess, anyway, will come up later in the discussion. And I want to end up with the picture, very, very, very naive picture. So stress that this is not... <laughs> Uh, something that you know you would teach at the university class. But when I ask a question, what was the difference? I don't know, a teenager, I ask a question, what is the difference between a statistician and a, pro a probabilist? This somehow was the answer I was given. Like if you have a bunch of observed data and you want to understand what is the underlying distribution, then you're a statistician. If you know the theoretical distribution and you want to say, now, if I take a sample, what do I get? What characteristics do I have? Then you are probabilities. And then this makes me think that what we are doing now is we observe a bunch of data in the market and we want to generate other data coming from the same distribution. So in some sense, we are doing job both of the statistician and the probabilist, but actually we don't even, uh, we are not even looking at, you know, uh, uh, we don't even want to find this distribution, whether this even exists, right? So we, I think, should understand methods of both theories, right? To not to do exactly, you know, the convolution of the two, but to go from observed data, so some data that, you know, uh, very similar, you know, in a uh, uh, trustful uh, way comes from the same uh, distribution. Okay, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bea. Thank you for your talk. Um, apologies for my mistake at the beginning. So we've got time for uh, maybe one or two short questions. If there are any from the audience, you can raise your hand. Okay, well, maybe while well, people think of other... Oh, Sam? Alex, Alex, please go ahead. Hi, thank you, Bea. Um, quick question. So. I'm not sure how far you've, you've got in the implementation, but if you're generating option prices, if I understand correctly, I guess you're doing vanilla call options, th they should have certain sort of structural, I mean, convexity and, and increasing and so on. These, yeah, no. Sorry. Yeah, you, it was, hmm? 
Sorry, does, does the stuff it generates observe these sorts of constraints, or are you hard coding them into the way you you formulate the, the call prices? Or yeah, so this is so again. This me the stop sharing so I can save you again. Uh, so we are far from having the complete picture, right? So now we are still, for example, doing uh, learning on like synthetic data, so we would know from which models we are, right, and try to uh, have some verification. But the idea of, so maybe this is too ambitious, I don't know whether this will work, right? But the idea of saying we are not just concentrating on the Q learning of specific derivatives, right? So we are not just saying uh, we observe like in the past, we observe certain kind of derivative like call options, and now we try to price the same kind of options. So the idea of possibly learning as much as we can of the evolution under Q is that then you could price any options under Q, right? Because what you are really training the generator is some path evolution. And then, you know, once this is trained, I would just take, generate, you know, many possible evolution, right? Conditional evolution and take the function of whatever derivative I'm interested in and take the average. So in this sense, you are not, you know, you're not constrained to, yeah, in the new derivative. When I'm, you know, this is when I'm pricing, right? But in the... Um, in the learning part, right? Of course, I'm doing, I'm testing on the data that I already have, right? So, of course, I'm testing on the derivative that I already have. Okay, but, but you're saying that the learning bit, you don't learn, it's not that you learn the derivatives prices, you learn, you learn a path measure. Yeah, or, you know, some information, you know, thereof. Because, of course, again, if I have very simple derivatives, even if I'm trained to, you know, produce some path, the only trustworthy thing is this, like, you know, marginal information, right? If I just have quotes, let's say. But if I've observed in the past enough exotic options that, you know, maybe tell me something about, you know, uh, some evolution in time that uh, what I'm trying to capture. But again, that's uh, that's an art task. So we are far from getting uh, yeah, something really good. Thank you. I think there is another question from Catherine. Um, we've got about a minute until the break, so this has to be quick. I, uh, yeah, I just want to know, no, um, again, so are you learning primarily the, the um, asset price evolution, so the underlying evolution at the moment? I mean, I, I understand that at the end, I mean, of course, you want to learn everything, but what's the starting point? The starting point, we are actually separating the two tasks and we are training on synthetically generated data, right? Either from a model or from, you know, some models. So if, let's say you pick your favorite model, you generate a long path, you know, evolution and you generate prices and then, okay, now this is my data set, right? So we are now like, you know, just trying to understand where the problems are, even like, you know, in, in separate learning and then optimally we want to put together. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Bea, once again. I think um, I suggest we take a break now for about five minutes and we resume at quarter to, uh, sorry, I'm in a different time zone, quarter to three uh, UK time at um, with um, Blanca Orvat and John Moriarty. But by all means, you know, if you want to have a discussion here on, uh, on the chat or, uh, you know, unmute yourself and have a chat, go ahead. Thank you. We are very happy to have Blanca here, Blanca Horvath, who is uh, who did her PhD at the ETH in 2015 with um, Josef Teichmann as her advisor. And afterwards, she moved to the UK with her postdoctoral fellowship at the Imperial College. And now she's a lecturer at the King's College and she's really very active in research and pushing forward her research to um, industrial engagement and industrial um, collaboration. So her research focus is on numerical and machine learning methods for option pricing and forecasting market simulation. And uh, one of her recent papers, which is called Deep Learning Volatility, a deep neural network perspective on pricing and calibration in rough volatility models, has drawn a lot of attention in academia and industry and is awarded um, the rising star in quant finance from RiskNet. And so should, today she speaks on the transformative role of new technologies on market models in quantitative modeling. So there's your stage. 
Thank you very much, Katrin. I was uh, I missed the beginning of the introduction, but I trust you that it was very nice. Uh, I hope that it's going to work out. Is it Alex now who's who has the slide there? Yep. Fantastic. If you could, uh, yeah. So, if we could start the presentation, that would be. Yeah, great. And thank you for, for doing all these backup checks. Uh, this is very, very useful because technology, even with the best precautions, sometimes can fail us. So here, I will be very brief today in these 15 minutes that I have. Uh, that therefore, a, a bit of a more overview-like presentation. And luckily, many of the previous speakers have uh, touched upon the topics that I would like to speak about anyway. So thank you very much for doing the, the, the tough work, Beatrice and, and, and Sam. Um, a bit of a quick overview of what I think uh, has been happening in the past um, couple of months and maybe one or two years um, and where the, the, the story is going and what are the things that I think are quite interesting here. Um, Supervised methods um, were the ones that came up as first in pricing and calibration. The scope of, uh, and approaches um, are, are quite um, appealing, even though that um, we know that we, we could only use them in a, in a restricted manner. Then I would like to speak about uh, unsupervised methods, market generation, and then finish with the outlook of what kind of uh, new horizons we will see for quantitative finance regarding uh, these new technologies coming from market generation that uh, they are very kindly already uh, introduced. We could go to the first slide real quick. So this I will be very, uh, very, very brief upon um, the supervised pricing and calibration. Um, I, I would like to mention these two papers where we try to understand what are the advantages, but basically the um, advantage of supervised pricing and calibration is an alternative way of using machine learning techniques numerically uh, to other existing numerical techniques. But still, and I think that's all on the next page, and if not everything appears, please do make everything appear in one part. So, thank you. Oops. That was too much. Thank you. So yeah, these were the advantages. You have a, a faster pricing uh, possibility, um, but the the limitations are are quite uh, condensed. Um, but we we could explore all the different possibilities of uh, pricing by supervised learning by speeding up uh, models, which enabled us to include models such as raw volatility models or mixture models by the ability to price everything faster. Whether we do it in a grid-wise uh, grid learning or a point-wise learning, we explored all the advantages there um, and the disadvantages and all, all uh, approaches in this context. However, the limitations are the same as, uh, as mentioned. We, uh, we can only do as well as other uh, numerical methods, uh, albeit much faster. Now, the real story, the real game changer starts when we speak about maybe the next slide, um, which is um, unsupervised pricing and calibration, which goes on along the lines of Bula, Gonon, Teichmann and, and, and Wood in their deep hedging program, where the hedger is optimizing a PNL um, and uh, learning optimal strategies. What I would like to mention here is this, um, this work and follow-up works to that very uh, nicely um, shows the interaction between network architectures and the data that we're applying it to. So in some sense, we see that the interaction between classical modeling and, and these new um, ways of, of um, modeling financial markets actually interplay quite well together. If we um, feed the networks data that, um, that are um, not uh, independent in the or that are not Markovian or that uh, have a specific structure, then it is also quite important to adapt the, the network architecture to that. On the other hand, 
existing models are quite good to uh, do sanity checks and to double check um, how the, the network architectures uh, and the networks itself are performing in the scenarios where we are able to um, backtest with uh, the existing results from uh, quantitative science, uh, finance. If we could go forward, maybe the, the full slide again, that would be amazing. So in some, in some cases, uh, it is quite important to, to match the network architecture uh, to the data that we're applying it to. And for this, it's quite important to have the, the models um, that we understand already, such as the, um, the statistical models or stochastic volatility models or even rough volatility models um, that we already understand quite well from a theoretical perspective. Um, this is illustrated in this case um, for a non-Markovian path of uh, rough volatility and this is just an example of a, an ongoing work where we uh, tried out rough volatility models uh, for a deep hedging engine and see that the original network architecture might uh, end up in, in, in vastly wrong um, hedging um, rules in case we, uh, we don't um, update the architecture. So I think the, the main uh, difference here is uh, what I many times probably have said already, but I, I quite like this viewpoint that there is in uh, contrast to classical modeling where we had some program, meaning um, model or a numerical algorithm but that we apply to data. Now there's this triplet containing an architecture, an objective function, and then training data, which will uh, give us our ability to make predictions or, uh, or modeling capabilities uh, for the future. And with that, um, the data has become a part of the, the model uh, or of this triplet, and this is the motivation of, of market generation um, moving forward. So that means uh, the quality of the training data shapes the neural network. If we are giving it some models that don't really reflect reality very well, uh, then we are in a difficult position because we, um, we will not be prepared for market scenarios uh, that we haven't seen before. So the market generation, um, meaning the generative modeling for financial markets, is, uh, let's say we, we can condense it down to two uh, advantages and two pro properties, one of them being that it is a model-free way of mimicking a, um, a financial price path evolution, and the other one being that it's... Um, that it has the ability to reflect distributions of returns or market paths way closer than uh, existing um, financial models. The reason being the UAT universal approximation theorem. So the more uh, nodes we're adding to the um, problem, the more closely we are able to reflect. So being mindful of the time, I will be very fast here and also knowing that uh, many of the people who have worked on this are present in the uh, in the call. The key question is, I think, the ev evaluation of the quality of these market generating models. And uh, if we look at these two graphs, um, I think it becomes very clear that it's um, not straightforward at all how to evaluate whether um, these sets of generated paths um, and match the real paths that you see in the picture, let's say on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, what would be good metrics to evaluate that? Where in the, the, the realm of returns or functions, these things have been established very well. Um, there is uh, quite a non-universality of, uh, of addressing these issues today in the uh, financial time series um, aspect. And usually so far what banks and uh, people in the industry were doing was uh, matching distributions at selected time points in this uh, stochastic evolution and then checking whether this generated data reflects the key um, stylized facts of financial markets and if, if that's, that does so then they are happy. Now the problem, I'm very very happy that Bea already mentioned that in quite some detail before, one of the problems among many is that for generative models, this may not be sufficient to measure the change from P and Q because we are only observing 
um, the, the price paths at given dates and we have infinitely many possibilities how to fill out the market evolution between those discrete observation dates. So this itself might not be sufficient and then many people uh, already uh, thought about how to address these uh, time series, many of them also in this call. Um, signatures seem to be a very, very uh, powerful uh, way of um, allowing to uh, address the quality of uh, financial path price path distributions. Um, and many of the works and underlying theory has been done in the past decades um, using signatures. Uh, maybe a very important article in this context is by Ilya Chavirov and Harald Oberhauser, who designed a, a very, very useful um, maximum mean, mean discrepancy test to check whether the price prices um, generated uh, by a generative modeling technique are similar to the observed paths in the market. So this is all quite nice. Now, what I would like to finish up with are um, three, there's actually more, but maybe just three, what I see as very, very important further applications of market generation. Data anonymization and outlier detection are um, applications that I have been speaking about so far uh, a bit already. The fact that, um, data has become a part of the models um, is quite challenging uh, due to the fact that there is many times some privacy considerations that financial institutions have to uh, be aware of and that makes um, comparisons or risk management of models across the sector quite, uh, quite challenging. However, if we are able to provide financial data sets that are um, close enough to the original ones, this might be lifted. Similar story for outlier detection um, using uh, generative models. The outlier detection seems to be just a side remark in some sense, but in fact, this, this is quite central for the idea of, um, of um, risk management of these new models using uh, machine learning and market generation. The reason for this is uh, that we have to be mindful of situations um, on the uh, human machine interface where we have to um, switch from the regular regimes that we are uh, that we are confident to pass on to automated um, markets and um, and in the regimes of outliers where we uh, where we encounter market scenarios that need uh, a real human decision maker with responsibility structures. And for that, there's many different uh, aspects to handle that. Um, one of them being market regime classification and the same underlying idea of separating regimes of um, well-known scenarios to outlier scenarios can also be used in very um, uh, useful investment problems such as identifying bull regimes and bear regimes for investment purposes. So I do think that all of these uh, all of these um, ideas create many interesting um, avenues for mathematical finance for the future. I thank you very very much for your patience with all these technical difficulties, and I'm uh, very glad to answer all questions as far as I can. Thank you. Please ask Richard. Hello, Richard, Richard Saldana. I'm, I'm probably best described as a practitioner. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Blanca, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was particularly intrigued by your final slide. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, but in particular, the market regime classification. I just wondered how far uh, if you've come in terms of uh, those types of models or using uh, market generator models in order to come up with um, you know, market regime classification or what I find right. the most difficult thing to do, determine the turning points. Right, right. So uh, we are actually quite far. 
uh, with uh, uh, PhD student Zakaria Issa. We are looking into that quite uh, closely and we're very, very close to actually submitting the paper. Uh, so I am happy to keep you updated when this happens. Um, it should be in the next weeks. But the, the ideas there are also very much based on this I cannot emphasize enough these hugely important works by uh, Cheverev and Oberhauser um, designing this uh, maximum mean discrepancy metric and, uh, and using that as a, as a way of, uh, of measuring distances and putting that into something that could be seen as an alternative to say k-means classification with two, three or several more regimes if that makes sense. So this is the basic idea of, uh, of the study that we're preparing. And also there, as, as uh, everywhere else in the process, the question of the correct and useful um, distance measures for, um, for differences between uh, these uh, data points um, are central. So we tried out quite a few of them, and uh, among them, uh, a very useful one, the, the maximum mean discrepancy metric based on signatures. Great. No, that sounds really interesting. So you're, I think, are you saying that sort of the, the wider the discrepancy or the more discrepancies one has, the more likely you are in a, you, to be in a, uh, a different regime, as it, as it were, to the one that you currently think you're in? Is that the idea? Well, um, let me put it this way. It, it depends quite strongly on the, uh, on the metric that you choose mm -hmm. for classification, what kind of clusters you end up with in the end, right? So depending on what metric you use, you will uh, prioritize one aspect uh, of the properties of the market to another. And um, what we understand is if we're um, looking into, let's say, a classical k-means clustering algorithm, we may not end up with uh, the results that would make sense to that particular problem. But if we change the metric to something that's more useful, then we might we we do in fact end up with clusters as we uh, expect them or as we would need them in that particular uh, case. So meaning we can, we say that, okay, if the clusters are um, close to one another to one scenario that we consider a, a bare regime, um, we end up with uh, other scenarios such as that one. And uh, we say we're looking at two cl clusters, one a bull market and one a bear market. Then it separates the two quite clearly from an, uh, one another if we choose the right metric. Um, However, uh, if we say we want to look at it in a more refined way, we can do that. There's also uh, clustering algorithms that uh, give the, the exact um, optimal number of clusters for your problem as part of the algorithm as well. So it depends on what you do, but I think what, what I wanted to emphasize here is that uh, it's central what kind of um, metric you use. For these sure. algorithms and the, the applications are quite vast so not only for risk management but also actually for investment purposes right okay yes now i'm aware so I'm, uh, <laughs> it's a very long conversation so thank you very much okay. thank, yeah, you. thank you very much and thank you very much for this nice discussion that i hope we can continue then in the panel and so let's move on um john john obtained his phd from the university of oxford and then he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University College of Cork and a lecturer, then senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. And uh, since uh, then in 2013, he has been EPSRC Early Career Fellow. And in 2015, he joined Queen Mary University of London as a full professor of mathematics. And John's working at the interface of applied probability, stochastic optimization and uh, energy so power systems management, and in 2019, he was one of the key organizers of the four-month program, the Mathematics of Energy Systems, held at the Isaac Newton Institute. And um, if I understood this correctly, some of this material that he'll present stems from discussions during this meeting. And so he will talk about 
Um, now I have to be careful that I pronounce this right. Please correct me, John, if not. Rang L, Rang L a competition-like environment for data-driven stochastic control problems. Thank you uh, very much. It's really a privilege to um, be invited to speak at this meeting. Um, data analysis and stochastic control, where do statistics and applied deployability come together? Um, so clearly it's a big and interdisciplinary question. And so um, I will just take a, a specific angle. Um, I'm going to talk about two parallel projects in my group, which um, indeed did start um, at the INI programme in Cambridge a couple of years ago. It's great to see uh, several friends uh, in the audience who were also um, there in the programme, so hopefully this is an interesting um, update for them too. So I'll talk first about some work on risk mappings, which is the term I'll use for um, what was nonlinear expectations uh, in Sam's talk uh, and their use in optimization. Um, so one preprint that's available and then one other work in progress. Um, and then also about uh, Wrangle, um, which is a, a research software engineering project uh, currently underway at the Alan Turing Institute, where I um, also have a position. So um, electrical power systems are one of the largest and most complex man-made objects ever created. Um, and therefore, some really interesting and important control problems arise in that context. Um, they're increasingly stochastic systems due to decarbonisation. So the, the inputs, um, renewable generation, it is clearly highly stochastic and variable. And also increasingly, the outputs uh, more stochastic due to new high current devices, electric vehicles, heat pumps, etc. Um, one uh, feature uh, of power systems is that events in geographically distant parts of the system uh, unfortunately interact strongly and in unexpected ways. Um, and so that's, that's indeed why from time to time we have these, uh, these, these big blackouts that, that hit the news. Control problems um, in power systems arise on multiple timescales and, and over the years um, in my group we've worked with power systems engineers uh, on some of these problems and I, I just provide in blue there um, so, some references to some of that work but um, some of these control problems are on the timescale of seconds so for example corrective control which is um, how a uh, power system, for example, seeks to correct a fault after detecting that, that a fault has happened. Um, on the hours timescale, we have the problem, the problem of generation scheduling. So um, how do we use our controllable power generation assets um, in order to meet various economic and, and emissions area and, and to keep the lights on clearly? And then also over the time scale of years, how do we um, improve, develop and expand uh, the system? So all of these um, con control problems are highly physically state constrained and clearly also highly risk constrained, um, given, the, uh, given how, how problematic, uh, for example, blackouts are. Um, the data is very high dimensional, so we have high time resolution. We have many different types uh, of measurements, uh, and these are coming from many different locations. Currently, there's, there's much reliance still on human judgment, um, but there's, there's certainly a desire in the industry to explore the potential benefits of automated decision making. Um, so a good example is, is Jack Kelly, who um, used to work for DeepMind and now works for National Grid on improving their forecasts of supply and demand in order to, um, to operate more efficiently. The, the French uh, system operator uh, sponsors a reinforcement learning challenge called L2RPN, and that's a, a competition that's running at the NeurIPS uh, conference at the moment. So, in terms of the data that's used in control problems in power systems, um, I think it's worth focusing on weather. 
Um, so clearly weather um, is now a main driver of uncertainty uh, in power systems. Um, as we know in Britain, weather forecasting can be difficult. Um, so it can be seen as a high dimensional deterministic initial value problem, but with uncertain initial conditions to which it is highly sensitive. Um, and we'll all have heard of Lorenz's butterfly effect with the butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazon, affecting the course of a, to a tornado in Texas, etc. Um, the approach that the state of the art in, in terms of representing um, uncertainty in weather forecasting is ensemble weather forecasting. Um, so a leading institute uh, is ECMWF, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, uh, and they produce 51 forecasts. So one control forecast and 50 perturba perturbations of it, perturbations both at the initial conditions and the forward weather model. And that's for various um, aspects of weather over a large geographical area, each one. So um, when we were discussing in, in Cambridge um, about control problems using these forecasts and combining them with uh, information uh, coming uh, from observations, um, this seemed to us to be uh, different to the usual sort of time series and stochastic process models um, that, that, that with which we are familiar. Um, and so the challenge of how to use, how to combine these ensemble forecasts um, and use these as an input to stochastic control um, inspired the two following projects. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's an archive preprint on, uh, on this work. So it's about risk aware optimal switching um, and it's joint work with my former postdoc, Randall Marta and Magnus Perniger at Lund. Um, so optimal switching problems are simply problems in which an agent is controlling a system by successively switching it um, between a discrete set of possible operational modes. Um, and in fact, it's a nice framework which generalizes um, the three previous problems that you saw uh, references to in blue. Um, so uh, given the, the nature of uh, the ensemble forecast, we took a non-Markovian setting also with an, with an arbitrary filtration um, working in discrete time. We took also a general nonlinear um, conditional risk mapping um, and we obtained the, the appropriate risk sensitive dynamic programming equations and existence and uniqueness results for um, certain related systems of reflected backward stochastic differential equations. Um, taking a uh, Taking an arbitrary filtration is nice because it allowed us to explore issues like um, missing information. So if your observations are missing at a particular time instant, which can really happen in, in power systems due to telecommunications problems or, or cyber attack or, uh, or other reasons, um, you, you can reflect that um, through the choice of filtration clearly. Um, and so we explore in that paper um, you know, what one should do in the case of missing information and how um, how using a nonlinear risk mapping interacts with that issue um, of missing information. Um, the next piece of work I want to mention is it, it is still in progress. Um, and so in order to um, in order to view control problems using these ensemble forecasts as filtering problems, um, in this work, we're, we're, we're working with a Markovian uh, assumption. Um, so this is joint work uh, again with Randall Marta and also with my um, current postdoc, Thomas Kosmala. So um, we, we provide actually a novel probabilistic setting of the Markov property when one's working with a nonlinear expectation, um, which, which has two components. So first of all, um, a regular conditional risk mapping which you can think of as a Markovian generalization of a, of a static risk mapping or nonlinear expectation, um, together with an update rule, which makes that dynamic. And then um, we make a study of, of the relationships between various forms of the Markov property 
um, yeah, uh, the Markov property for a nonlinear expectation. So this probabilistic setting, also the um, the analytic setting, uh, which is sort of one step ahead Markov property, which was um, studied by Rizinski uh, in 2010 and, uh, and other authors subsequently. Um, we also look in the convex case uh, at the dual representation um, un under various conditions. Um, so time consistency, convexity, continuity from below or above of the risk mapping, um, assumptions on the regularity of the test function uh, and on the countability of the state space. And then uh, uh, we, we apply um, we, we apply what we find to uh, to a simple optimal stopping problem, but uh, but with filtering under nonlinear expectation. Okay, so those were our small contributions um, in terms of, of methodology towards solving some of these um, some of these control problems. Um, here is something completely different. So the other project I want to uh, speak about is Wrangle, um, which is um, a software engineering project underway at the Turing Institute at the moment. Um, and Wrangle is all about providing a, a standardized environment um, for data driven stochastic control problems. Uh, and so the idea is that with such a standardized environment that makes it easier for problem holders to pose their problems, it makes it easier for people working on solutions to show the value of those solutions um, on the problems that are being proposed, it makes it, um, it, it gives a, a way to compare um, which kinds of solutions work well on which kinds of problems um, and also to test with bespoke solutions against um, sort of more generic methods, reinforcement learning agents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we're, we're putting together um, th this platform Wrangle and it's, it's powered by um, so, some, some of the latest uh, software tools, uh, which you can see listed across the bottom. Um, Wrangle is very much an, an active project. Um, and we will be shortly uh, making a call for participation. Um, so it would be great if, uh, if, this, if this grabs you as an idea, uh, it'd be great to have as many of you as possible um, joining in with the project in, in, in some role. Um, so there's work to do in integrating uh, data sets, in uh, developing the platform itself, um, if you want to be a hacker, either trying to break the platform or to prove that it's possible to cheat in, in, in competitions on the platform, that would also be welcome. Um, obviously, there's, there's opportunities to compete um, in, the, in the challenges um, or to help us to set challenges. We're working on challenges in the integration of uh, electric vehicles into local ele electricity networks. We're working on uh, generation scheduling challenges, also actually on um, on some pure finance challenges. Um, so please um, feel free to, to sign up at wrangle.org um, if that's something that interests you. And, and you can see just there on the screen um, uh, some of the people, the great people that we have uh, in the Wrangle team at the moment. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I think data analysis and stochastic control do come together in important ways. Um, uh, for example, in, in risk averse control problems arising in infrastructure using numerical weather predictions. Um, and there's much exciting work clearly still to do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much, John, for this very interesting talk and um, this proposal of this wrangle. Uh, so are there any questions or comments here from the audience? Yes, Tiziano. Hi, John. Thanks for the talk. Um, I, I, I do have a, a, a question. At some point, you, you say that the way data are um, sort of collected and used in um, weather forecasting for power system um, management is different to the 
way we would normally um, do it with time series and so on. And you mentioned this en ensemble forecast. Um, can you maybe give us a sense of what this entails in practice and how this is different to just time series as we know them? Yes, yeah, so uh, as I say, the way an ensemble is generated um, is by taking multiple different possibilities for the initial conditions of the climate and then evolving each of those initial conditions forward in time, um, potentially under a slightly different climate model. Um, so, for example, if you have an observation, um, that, that introduces non-Markovianity um, straight away if you um, if you think about it. So, for example, I mean, a common situation is that um, a system operator will know that a storm is coming and that will imply a certain very steep gradient in, in wind power output. So they, they know the gradient is coming, they just don't know at what, what time it's coming. Um, and so, you know, clearly that's, that's a, that's a, a non-Markovian situation. Um, th these, these, these ensembles give you information, right, pa about, about paths. Um, and you want to take in, however you add a probabilistic structure to that ensemble forecast, you want to take care to uh, preserve the, inf the pathwise information that, that's in those ensembles. And is this something that somehow gives you um, some uh, confidence interval on how likely each scenario is going to be or or is or am I, maybe I'm getting it wrong? Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I should have said they're supposed to be understood as equally likely. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, do you have already some um, sample um, challenge for this Ringel system? So something that's, so that I get a concrete picture of it. Yes. Yeah, so we we've run a couple of challenges internally, mm -hmm. um, and we're planning in January to run a, a soft launch. Um, so it's going to be a, a generation scheduling challenge. So the the, the sort of hours time scale problem that I mentioned. Um, so if yeah, if you're interested in in participating, that then please just sign up. Um, and we'll, we'll send out an announcement. I see a hand still. Is this you, Tiziano, or is there someone else? I can't find. Hello. Uh, yes, it's uh, David Hughes from Affinity ah. Water. Um, thanks to all the participants and all the work in has been a great session. I have a question, if I may, please, to, to John. And the question, which I'll also post in the chat, is um, would you see this being applied to environments across time series such as call centres, so high volume customer interactions, either just BAU or particular stress events, uh, and also exploring probability of volume of calls and timing of them, things like payments, call variances in call durations and the volatility around that as well. Is that something you could see as being applied to either as a generic, either as a generic concept or specifically as a, uh, a challenger within this wrangle uh, setup? Thank you very much for the question. So um, we so we, we we deliberately make minimal assumptions. Um, in, we we formulate stochastic control problems as reinforcement learning problems, or in the reinforcement learning framework. So um, it, it simply means that you have an environment. Uh, you are an agent, and you're within. You're acting within an environment, and time steps forward, and at each time based on the observations that you have at that time, you, you take an action. Um, that action then may alter the environment in some way. You receive the new observations for your, from your environment and some measure of reward as a result of your actions. And that whole thing just repeats forward. Um, and so essentially any dynamic control problem can be put into that framework. And the advantage is that it's a standard computational framework um, that already exists. Um, so there's something called OpenAI Jim, um, which, which standardizes um, that, that situation and also provides um, reinforcement learning alg algorithms that you can immediately apply um, to, to get a solution to your problem once it's, once it's formulated uh, in the environment. 
Thank you. Thank you. So I think this will be very interesting to explore. And thank you very much for this. And we make, so we are a bit delayed, but I think that's not such a big deal. So we will make a five minute break and we will start with a panel discussion then on 3.40. So if you want to stay for chatting now, um, please do so. Here the time is already adapted, so that is the correct one. So we continue at 3.50. See you then. We prepared a few questions sort of generally on, on this theme of, of stochastic control and, and data analysis, which um, we'll go through with the panel, but hopefully will be an opportunity for people in the audience as well to comment or um, add their own opinions. Um, I should say, I guess, I mean, I guess between the, the organisers and the panel, I think we're all coming from um, certainly a, a very academic background. Um, most of us come from stochastic control, a lot of us from finance, so I guess a lot of the perspectives there come from that background, but I think we'd be very welcome to, to takes from, from other backgrounds and other directions as well in here, which um, hopefully can help add some extra interest to the discussion. Um, I guess, um, so perhaps I can start with the first, let me go to my slide, sorry, the first question. So, um, so the first question I have is, is really about, um, I guess, sort of a combination of two of the things we, we've seen today. So driven, driven, I guess, by advances in, in machine learning, AI, we're, we're moving into a world where, where data is, is, is becoming a lot more complex and we can, we can see a lot more complex data sets. We can handle a lot more complex data sets. Um, and obviously the questions we want to ask, and I guess this is very much what John was talking about right at the end with his wrangle setup is, is just how do we how do we deal with complex data sets and control? Um, and in particular, I think for me, this seems to, to particularly pose um, some big questions when we're thinking about um, complex data sets and machine learning, because you can you can analyze data as it comes in. So this is what, what both Beatrice and Blanca were talking about to some extent. You, we can try to reconstruct complex data sets, but as soon as we want to try and do some sort of control in those data sets, in lots of cases, we're going to, to influence the data we observe. And if you're trying to learn something and then also learn how it reacts to you and optimize over that, that seems to be something that, that is going to make a lot of these approaches very hard when we want to bring in, in complex control. So I, I guess the first question, was: do any do the panel sort of see ways of trying to approach these problems that, that might have some chance of success or, or um, ideas or approaches that people have used in the past that, that might 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 have some element of success in here. So perhaps Sam, I guess you were you were the one who was talking about about interaction and control. Would you want to to start? Sure. So I think one of the things is that a lot of the approaches that have been shown to work in practice in this area, they depend largely on sensible heuristic approximations to big chunks of the problem. Um, so if you come at a lot of these things from a stochastic control perspective, your first thing is, OK, I've got a control problem. I write down everything. I write down some huge PDE. And you end up with something that you simply have no way of modeling well, let alone solving it numerically. And what you see in a lot of, say, the reinforcement learning literature is that you, you take sensible approximations of some pieces of the puzzle um, so that you can solve other pieces well. And this allows you enough flexibility that you can interact with market simulators or generators of various sorts that you can calibrate. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done, a lot of improvements that are out there. But I think what it's going to involve is a bit of a relaxation of the the idealism, uh, the mathematical idealism of that's been traditional in stochastic control. John, do you, I mean, I guess this is it, thinking about Wrangell and, and the, the numerical side of the, or the, I guess, trying to implement this in practice and perhaps also from, we're talking about this weather setup. Are these, are these well, so I suppose weather is not something where you observe the control, but um, are these things you've thought about having to deal with or? 
Well, I'd, I'd certainly um, fully agree with um, Sam's comment on, on relaxing um, the idealism that, we, that we've had uh, in stochastic control. Um, yeah, I mean, the the question just re does remind me of, of, of this um, agent environment loop um, that I mentioned from, from the reinforcement learning formulation. I mean, if, I mean, I, if we have, uh, if we have appropriate simulators, um, of the, of the effect of, of agent actions upon the environment, then, um, then, then, it, then in principle, um, yeah, we, we can, we can assess the quality of solutions. And, and I guess that's really the idea behind AI, many AI competition platforms in general. Um, so if we can perform re repeated trials um, uh, of this, uh, of the agent in, in this environment um, with, with proper randomization each time and proper separation of training and test um, seeds, um, I think we should, we should indeed give proper consideration to, to how we assess performance. So, um, you know, that the simple linear average of performance over many different random seeds might be appropriate um, if it's a problem that's, that's repeated many times. But if it's a problem that's um, experienced a few times, then, then you know, maybe we, we should be applying a nonlinear average, a nonlinear metric to performance. Um, or indeed, if, if the consequences of poor performance are, are severe, like in infrastructure, um, then, then I think, yeah, um, I, I think the, these concepts of nonlinear expectation uh, are important and, and maybe, you know, maybe it could be important to build them into reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, for example. So thank you. Did anyone else want to come back on that or add something to, to what John said? I'd also say maybe we need to move a little bit away from the idea of optimal control. Um, in many of these problems, where we understand the we don't understand the systems we're interacting with over the whole of their possible range, we feel we've got a pretty good understanding locally. And when you've only got local understanding, then you don't try and do optimal control. You try and make things a little bit better than they are. Um, and so the, it's that that marginal gain. And I think that perhaps this is the way that um, a lot of stochastic optimal control is going to move. It's going to be much more about how do I improve my problem rather than how do I optimize it fully. Or is it also, I don't know, right? Like pre-selecting, because now mathematically we would write, to have, you know, like we formalize, like, you know, we want to optimize over all, I don't know, predictable processes in a big sigma, whatever. But is it rather maybe, okay, let's, uh, consider a smaller set of possible actions and we just see which one of those, like in a very simple class, maybe doing an optimization there. Like, I don't know if this is also a... Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that very much to, to start and to start testing out on areas where we understand the outcomes better or where we are able to control that better. But I think maybe it's a it's a good thing to revisit this uh, quick statement that was made maybe in a bit hasty manner during the presentation. Um, that comes from the observation we've seen for deep hedging in in cases where uh, the data and the structures are the same as in classical settings, we we can build in such um, sanity checks where we expect the, the, the networks to produce the uh, classical results again. And we've also seen that you know, these, uh, these hedging engines were also able to in, in incorporate scenarios with transaction costs where classical results have not existed before. So they, they indeed, expand in some sense the horizons to to situations that we have not seen before um but uh, as it, it's classical in risk management in banks uh, if we uh, build in such sanity checks that's a good start although as as sam said before it's quite a local um solution only and uh not a full solution Okay, thank you. Um, 
Are there any comments on that from the audience that anyone would like to add to? Um, so perhaps then we can move on to the next question, which perhaps follows on a bit. Uh, so obviously, and perhaps this is slightly my perspective, I mean, to something I think I agree with, with, with what people have been saying, but I, I guess the, one of the difficulties from a, from a theoretical perspective as you start to move away from classical notions of optimality is, of course, how we, I mean, I think most people, everyone, in the panel at least, is coming from a fairly rigorous background in, in sort of a mathematical background as opposed to a more statistical machine learning background. I hope I'm not <laughs> not misrepresenting anyone here. Um, and I think we would probably all have some sympathy with the idea that, that what we want to come up with still are rigorous state, statements that have some fundamental truth to them, some, something that can move beyond just I can show this is a bit better in a few examples, which I think is is traditionally the strength of mathematics. So how do we, I mean, I, agreeing with, with the general idea that, that we need to move towards these ideas of local optima, how do we, are there ideas there or things that we need to bear in mind if we want to try and do that in a way that keeps up with with obviously what, what, what the solutions coming from machine learning, the, the, these far more computational methods are producing, are there, are there still things that we can say from a theoretical perspective that are valid and important? Are there still, are, are there sorts of results we should be aiming for? Sam, you're talking about local optimality. Are, are there good theoretical ways of, of, of discussing these in, in contexts that, that make sense or which we can aim for as a community to, to try and be working on? Yeah. And perhaps, perhaps that doesn't matter. Perhaps, perhaps rigor is just not relevant to the people who are going to be doing this. Um. I'd look at this slightly differently because the, I think it's interesting to see some of the things that are happening, say, in machine learning, where if you go and you actually try and do machine learning, you you learn the the basic toolkit, and you you get to a point, and then suddenly you hit this point where you get thrown sort of uh, very high dimensional optimization theorems, Wasserstein distances, these things that require quite a level of technical maturity, if not rigor, but technical maturity to engage with. So I, I'm pretty positive about the role for rigorous theory coming into uh, this new way of doing things. I think that we're actually, we're, we're opening up the, the floodgates for uh, functional analysis and friends to come and really have quite a lot to say. Um, is rigor important? I think there will always be a level at which rigor is needed. People want to know that what they're doing is well founded, well justified. I think there will be, as I think there already is, a level to which pure theorem is not enough. You need to demonstrate that what you've done actually works as well as that you can prove it works. Um, Donald Knuth had that famous line um, where he'd, um, he wrote out an algorithm and said, I've only proved this works, I haven't checked it um, and run it. And I think there'll be a bit more of that where our proofs don't matter. They, they don't matter. They're not the end of the story. We have to go and implement and show. But I think that already exists in at least in math finance, which is always, well, it's developed in this strange halfway house between a very practical applied field and uh, a very rigorous technical, um, let's have fun with stochastic analysis field. And uh, the fact those two have been joint for a long time, I think puts it in a, a good place uh, for these changes. Yeah, I think exactly, I, I agree. Uh... 100% that somehow now we want that things work in theory and in practice. Like it's really like kind of double validation, right? So we need some theoretical results because I will have some, now I have a bunch of students very enthusiastic, right? To try machine learning and mathematical finance. But then I see also some approach that are just trying some architecture, right? Without any support. And you know, you can get enthusiastic if it works once, but then you have no, absolutely no idea of how this, can be useful, right? Or, I mean, there would be no end user that would accept, right? They just a black box. So, 
So definitely we need, as you, I mean, you, you mentioned vastness and this, and of course, or many, like in any way we want to either to build an architecture or to validate something, we really need like, you know, if you already know, okay, I'm optimizing a problem that has a unique optimizer, right? So if you can prove mathematically that you have such a problem, a strictly convex problem, then okay, if you have an algorithm that, you know, is convergent and stable, somehow, you know, like it really gives a support, right? So I think they really, really need to interact. And I think um, at least in math finance, we all come from, you know, usually we look at the problem, right? We try to formalize it, solve the mathematical things and then go back, right? And now in this formalization, looking at the problem, we have to consider also the data. So now the data is part of what we need to take into consideration, right? Uh, I think there is really, really beautiful mathematics that can be done, like fitting all theorems of universality, right? As a support for uh, algorithm working. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I think Bea mentioned a, a very important keyword over here on, on convexity. And uh, maybe this is something to, uh, to hang our coats on, to, so to say. So that is um, in, in several situations when it comes to high dimensionality problems and, and machine learning problems, the issue becomes the local versus global optimality conditions and making sure that we don't get lost in some of the global optima. Um, that that don't really answer our question in uh, in a in a satisfactory manner. Um, however, here comes this this uh, concept of creating feature sets or being mindful of of architectures that could perhaps help us towards um, formulating problems uh, that uh, that become convex problems in in that kind of scenario and. Um, for example, in this case of, you know, um, when we looked at um, pricing by neural networks, looking at the, the point-wise versus uh, grid-wise optimization problem, it was a key element to create a feature set um, that allowed to, to not get lost in, um, in local uh, optima. So maybe uh, this will be uh, an important direction. And I'd, I'd just add that um, you know we shouldn't um, underappreciate the extent to which theoretical results are already practically useful um, in, in machine learning. Um, so, so there's lots of um, nice work out there on you know relationships between the amount of distracting information and the learning rate. Um, you know what kind of capabilities and information you need to to learn different kinds of tasks successfully. Um, you know, providing guarantees for algorithms of, of convergence, of exploration, exploitation, trade-offs, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we should be, I think we should be pushing an open door um, when, when offering rigor. I think one thing that will change, however, is that the, the changes to this big data, AI, ML, whichever word we want to use, um, they mean that it's going to be less possible for mathematicians, particularly who are very used to working almost independently of anyone else, or maybe with one or two other people. There'll be an increase in projects like Wrangle, um, where you've got relatively large teams working on a problem together. And the fact that that's going to be a team built up with people from different disciplines, you'll have computer scientists, you'll have uh, domain experts, whether they're in ecology, weather, economics, finance, these different disciplines having to work together means that we are going to have to learn how to work better with other disciplines. And that means changing the way we view our rigor um, as the, the seal of approval. Okay, I think there's a Question from the audience, Richard? Yes, hi, thanks. Um, I mean, it's a related but general question. Um, don't you feel that the space is moving so fast that whilst it's really nice to have global proofs of convergence, um, it's a real nicety? That is, that is um, yes, if you want to take one specific facet uh, and work on that, absolutely fine. But um, the way people are working now, they're... Um, they're looking at such a, a wide range of techniques that um, it's very difficult to have that that sort of focus that you're suggest, suggesting, because um, 
you know, people want the results. I suppose, if I may, um, I see the, I don't see this as particularly new. If you look historically, it's often been the case that, say, engineers have been doing things and then the mathematicians have followed them up to, to figure out how they're working and why. And I think the thing, what I expect to happen is that just like what's happened in the past, the, the things that mathematicians end up being interested in and can prove results about are not those at the absolute cutting edge of research in this space but they are the things that we get solid, we get stable, and which then provide the new cutting edges later on. Um, I think we, we shouldn't be ashamed of the fact that we are sort of behind the curve, but we reinforce where it's going to go, speaking as a mathematician. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely, um, you know, appreciate that. And um, where was I going to go? Um, but uh, machine learning in particular is is a very sort of applied science. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate what yeah, Sam says, that we work at a different speed. So it is true that, you know, if I mean, now that is, yes, the new rips going on and there are like, you know, thousands of presentations, right? It's difficult even to keep track, right? As a mathematician, I mean, I think I'm even lost when I think, you know, okay, you know, where can we help, right? So, but I, I really agree with what Sam says, that in the end, we will have to, you know, understand some crucial, you know, uh, problem and, you know, work our time to, you know, to get good answers. And then there would be the base for you know, some development in machine learning. But it is clear that we go at a different speed. Sure, sure. I mean, just a comment from my practical sort of work experience. If I give the same problem to a mathematician as I give to uh, an engineer, um, the engineer will generally come back with some type of, of, of working solution. The mathematician will say there are uh, you know, 10 assumptions that are violated. I wasn't able to do anything. And I'm, I'm, uh, I, am a, I am an applied <laughs> mathematician now. I'm a statistician, but I, I have got a, an undergraduate degree in mathematics. So I hope I don't sound too rude. Catherine, did you want to add something? Oh, yes, uh, because I thought that, um, for instance, um, Blanca's example is of a different um, of a different kind where um, she shows that using the theory informed method um, ends up in a better solution. So I think there's also this there is not only the aspect of proving something works, but also that um, yeah, a theory informed measure, for instance, can change the game. So I think that's also an, an aspect that could be interesting for practice. Yeah. And uh, but then I also had this question that because now as a method mathematicians we think of this rigor. So so um, seeing this rigor. So this was one aspect. But what's really your take as practitioner on rigor? So so what do you think about it? Well, I, I love rigor, and I actually still worry that, that I don't have a global proof of convergence for my likelihood equations in my my uh, doc doctoral thesis, um, but I managed, they still gave it to me. Um, very, very nice to have, but it can take um, a huge amount of effort and a very long time to, to, have, to have that nicety, as it were. And you may find it's not even true. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think it's a very important point made here that uh, it has to be somewhere in the middle ground. And uh, OK, obviously, this is a, a um, let's say, a bit presumptuous to say that mathematicians will not uh, come back with a solution, but it goes in the correct uh, direction. And I think we, we all have to have this a little bit in mind. On the other hand, I think what Sam says is also quite important that we kind of go behind the curve a little bit and try to pick up the the observations uh, where we think that the engineers running ahead may not have uh, seen or been aware of some problems that might end up in in, in bigger uh, issues such as if we if we look at this uh, market generation paper that came out in in the industry in the beginning um, they were indeed looking at the most uh, straightforward or most uh, natural way of uh, doing market generation by returns on a discrete grid. Uh, and there it's quite useful to 
kind of go in their footsteps and look at it and say, well, yes, uh, in some sense, this seems to be a very good uh, solution. However, uh, you may end up with uh, huge losses if you don't keep in mind that uh, there is an issue. And uh, I think we do have quite some responsibility there to bring in our uh, expertise. Sorry. Thank you. Can I, so there was a question, another question from the audience from Yong Chao. Uh, yes, please. Sir. Okay. Uh, first, I said thank you all for the very nice presentation and the beautiful discussion. So, uh, this is Yong from computer science background. Uh, uh, I've got a background in engineering and finance as well. So, uh, I can appreciate both all the beauties from both sides, like mathematics and engineering. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, what, what I want to co uh, comment on is that uh, um, there won't be any general theory of framework for, like, for learning methods, I would say. And unfortunately, and I pretty much agree with Sam on that. Uh, so that, uh, definitely we need more like a series for or any that's from which learning methods uh, currently people are developing like uh, other material capabilities or even influence. Uh, influence for like a different networks so definitely we need more serious but also in the, i'm very promise uh i'm very promise about the future but also uh machine learning is more like methodological so uh it's a, it's it's more like a blood science currently but in the future it's gonna be more theoretical i, I would believe but anyway uh sam also mentioned that uh, for example, for in uh, reinforcement uh, learning setting, people are looking for local optimization. Yeah, that's definitely true. So basically, we are talking about uh, the difference between white box and the black box approach. And this is uh, either approach, which is called the gray box approach, which brings together, like, uh, for example, traditional two people model based uh, modeling, which, is, uh, which can be described by PD, even like Asian or Macabre or whatever whatever models, but uh, machine learning people are more interested in like, using statistic methods, which is uh, not uh, physics-informed models. So uh, I would argue that this is uh, something that can bring both sides together and uh, generate a uh, very beautiful but, uh, yeah, that's my argument. Thanks very much. So I think the I'm struggling a bit with the line. Did, did you catch? No. Sorry, I, I think, Yong Chao, the line is not very good. It, it was quite hard to hear what you were saying. Maybe, maybe. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, I would like to thank you all. That's all. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a commencer, but so maybe my connection is not good. But anyway, yeah, it, it's very good discussion. Maybe, yeah, if I can adjust the small other things. As in, like, you know, from the theoretical side, it's not just, you know, about proving, uh, you know, big theorems, like for universal theorem or general theory. But sometimes also, like, you know, knowing the theory, we have, you know, we always need to make a choice, right? Whether it is what architecture, whether it is what distance to take and so on. And I mean, we should have, you know, educated guesses, right? That come from knowing like what happened in certain moments, rather than, you know, being biased or like, you know, or even like, you know, in explaining assumptions, right? What they mean, or in looking at the data and maybe recognizing some stylus fact that come from certain models, right? Or, you know, they are support so i think there is also some yeah i would say like you know um different eyes of looking at the data for example even if we know that you know the data would not follow a specific model but we can recognize some patterns that is a typical of some models which have this kind of behavior right or this correlation or this mean reversion so i think there is also some good intuition that too comes you know from maybe a math background right instead of engineering it on the other side you know uh, engineers must have a better intuition about how to tune parameters that we maybe have no clue about, right? So, okay, thank you. Um, I was going to move on, actually, skip over a question and go to the to, to this one here about because I think it came up in a few of the talks in various ways. So, um, I mean, the first bit is about sort of application areas. So, obviously, I think a couple of the talks have focused on finance. John talked about weather, um, but are there sort of application areas that, that we think are underappreciated in terms of uh, interesting problems or challenges for, for the applied probability community? Um, and sort of within that also, um, 
some some problem areas and so so i think um blanca mentioned this when she talked about data anonymization um are much harder for, for us as academics to look at because of problems with with accessibility of data or sharing data confidentiality i mean healthcare is another area where there's obviously um very big problems with sharing data or, or making data available um so um are those features that we think should be important and does should that mean that the, the challenges as a community we should be focusing on come from within those areas don't come from within those areas should we as a community be focusing on a small number of of common problems or should we be trying to spread out on on lots of different question areas I mean, should we just try and spread ourselves thinly and all all choose a different you know biology chemistry we could all you know there's lots of different application areas out there what sort of approach should we as a community be taking to some of these these sort of questions Blanca, I think you've got your hand up. That yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, although I'm, I'm not going to be giving you an answer to this because it's a very big, uh, big, an uh, big question to answer. But I, I do think that uh, a partial answer is possible. Possible when you ask uh, whether there are uh, challenges that have not been looked upon too much yet by our community, and I really believe that this uh, aspect of data anonymization and measuring the degree of data anonymization is something that would be quite useful for for us as a community to look into in a more, um, let's say, um, regular or more more rigorous fashion, because there are measurements out there. Um, but I don't really uh, believe that uh, all of these measurements and all of these metrics uh, can be fully applied to our uh, situations and scenarios. And I think there is quite a broad agreement that data and uh, in particular anonymous data is, is quite an important factor in uh, the modeling that we will be doing going forward. Um, and Therefore, it uh, would be quite useful to be able to make such guarantees of data anonymity alongside with the data quality. So, um, so John, I, I guess in Wrangell, is data anonymity something you've you've had to think about or, or worry about? Is this a question that's that's come up? Yeah. So, um, so when we talk to to industry uh, about you know what, what what their challenges are of interest. This always comes up, um, and, um, and and I think I I sort of to an extent I think there's a dis there's, there's a distraction um, that one wants to avoid. Um, so I mean, at least from our perspective, I think what we see is you know we're, we're trying to build a competition platform so. We look at something like Kaggle, and, and what that's been successful at is showing what kinds of solution approaches work on well on what kinds of problem, or one of the things it's been good at. And so, as long as the data is of the right kind, then having exactly this or that data set seems a bit less important um, for, for this goal of just learning in general. Uh, you know, this this mapping between um, type of problem and uh, and type of solution. So. Um, uh, I think so. So these problems are definitely real, um, and I think they're in in some cases they're just intractable. So there are some data sets that you can promise to be really careful, but it's just not going to fly. Um, and so you just have to find a way around it. Uh, and and so synthetic data, I, I think, um, is, is the way forward there. Sam, did you want to? I was just thinking your your question, what application areas are underappreciated? I think it's related to the the question of what data is available. Um, so the the examples you've given so far, well, we've talked about weather, relatively little controversial data there. It's something we've been recording for a long time. It's relatively easy to get data on. Um, big wholesale finance as well. there's been a there's been some clear gains to the industry from interacting with the applied probability community. And so there's been a good flow of data to an extent there. Where I see us not working is there's very little work at the individual level for a big population. There's, I'm not aware of a lot of 
interesting applied probability models that apply to cities, countries at that level, although there are some coming in epidemiology now. Um, I'm, and I think that we'll see more and more of these sorts of things coming up. But they're the, as soon as you start working on individuals, you end up with both privacy issues in data, but also big ethical questions where just because we can do things doesn't mean that we should. And we need to be aware of that when we're thinking about problems. Blank, is your hand still up or? Oh, no, no, no. Sorry about that. And it's, it's, it's down. <laughs> Sorry. I was also thinking, I don't know, so it also related to the project of John, like, so we don't have like, uh, like a common task framework, right? So like, I think we would, you know, beside the specific data set that can be, you know, one specific firm or one situation, which, you know, it has the you know, delicate issue of privacy and so on. But I think it would also be nice to have, you know, like a set of uh, benchmark data sets. It can be some synthetically created, you know, some coming from industry a set of uh, family of statistics and, you know, to be able to, to test different models against uh, some benchmark, right? So at least to say, okay, like this kind of benchmark, it uh, reproduces, like, you know, if you can reproduce this, you can reproduce well, like, you know, I don't know, uh, correlation between uh, the, the elements here, right? This benchmark, if you do it well against it, this is testing, I don't know, like, you know, how much you have to look into history, this one. So I think that, we need also some common ground of you not know, to be able to evaluate something and this may also help with the privacy people to could say okay now if i want to use against the data set i will add this specific data set to the class of you know other data sets to test and this is music for our ears isn't it sorry this is music for our ears it's it's i i couldn't agree more uh, thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah Okay, thank you. Are there any comments on this sort of area from, from the audience? Or? Okay, perhaps I have one last question, which is, um, so what I would, I guess, you know, describe as stakeholder understanding of modeling. So, um, I mean, I, I guess within, within finance, this is the clear example of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, I think more recently, if you've been following, I guess most people have the, the COVID discussion. I think um, there's been lots and lots of, of discussion and um, argument about what effectively boils down to modeling assumptions that, that people have in different models, the different ways people approach all sorts of modeling, which obviously is not something as a mathematical community we're that used to, but, but with COVID, I think has become a, obviously a very publicly open open thing. And, and I think it's highlighted to me, one of the things is from a classical control, stochastic control perspective, I think modeling is, is generally relatively simple and it's relatively easy to explain to people what the modeling approaches are. And I think as a community, we can easily explain what modeling inputs we're putting in and hope to communicate to people using models reasonably clearly where the limits of those models might lie. But, but as our processes become more complex, as, as we're using tools that, uh, I mean, coming from ML and AI, where it, it just becomes much harder to understand what the assumptions are that go into the black boxes or, or that are coming out. And I mean, I think Bear and Blanky you've both also been talking in terms of your data sets about how important is actually some of the modeling choices are for these black boxes, even if even though it's not quite clear what those modeling assumptions or even if they're not modeling assumptions, they're, they're sort of, I think you're talking about them as architectural assumptions. It's much harder to communicate to an end user. These are the architectural assumptions that go into a complicated modeling situation. Um, so, I mean, I guess the question is, is I mean, we can't, we can't explain to our end users or sit them down and, and make them do a course in machine learning just, just to try and understand the answers. So, so the question is, how do we try and sort of act responsibly in in this this area when we when when the modeling assumptions we're putting into things are quite hard to, for people to responsibly understand without 
well, even for the, for the people at our end who are, are perhaps constructing the models to really understand the consequences of what, what should be, where, where should we start with these sorts of questions? How should we try and try and ensure that our models are used responsibly and, you know, hopefully that we don't get blamed for the 2050 global financial crisis or whatever the next, 2050 is probably optimistic, right? But, Anyone want to want to start on that? I think I think there are analogies, at least, to um, fairly traditional questions about responsibility and ethics in engineering in medicine. Um, I I do wonder whether we need to look at the way machine learning is moving forward and push for some sort of chartering type system. I'm not advocating that necessarily, but where there is a, an ethical responsibility for those who are doing the analysis to ensure that those using it are informed in the level of a informed consent. Um, but it's tricky to know how to, how to do this. Um, and I think, as I said, drawing on some of the, the engineering uh, type principles of what does it mean to be a responsible engineer would be worthwhile for mathematicians and data scientists more generally moving into this space. So, so uh, Blanca, I'll bring it back to one of the things. You, so in your talk, I think you, you asked the question about how do we evaluate the, the quality of, of your market generators? And I, I guess this yeah. is, this this comes back, I think, to this, or well, partly to this point, I guess. I mean, yeah. obviously. Yeah, and to the into the previous point as well, I just didn't want to uh, interrupt that when I remember that in fact my hand was not left up uh, by by accident, but I did want to say some, add something on that part as well. So even if we're using synthetic data, this question of how do we evaluate whether our data is similar to to the original data at hand and so on, so forth. Um, all of these aspects are interconnected with one another. So even if we use synthetic data it is possible to trace it back to the original data set that it was modeled on in some cases. So it's it's not fully uh, fully foolproof, even if we're using uh, real data. Just let's take a, a very stupid example. If we're taking a data set with an outlier of, let's say, um, um, Microsoft having particularly high returns in one of the years, whereas the rest of the sector uh, performed differently, then if we produce a synthetic data set that, that reproduces this feature that one element stands out and the others uh, are, are fairly similar to one another, then this will be uh, possible to be traced back, even though um, it's an artificial data set. So uh, there are quite a few uh, reverse engineering techniques, even using um, generative models and deep neural networks that are able to, in some sense, to a certain degree, uh, trace back uh, artificial data sets, depending on the chosen uh, objective function uh, to uh, the original training samples that were given. So I really do think that this question is a much more complex and a much more interesting question to look at that we have, or at least I speak for myself, at least I have thought so far until looking more deeply into it. Yeah, I lower my hand. I think Tiziano has the hand. <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, yes, I have um, some sort of misgivings about all these things and then it might be because I just am um, very new to the, to the whole area. But I was reading about a number of um, different types of biases that you could introduce in the training set of your um, AI algorithm or uh, machine learning algorithm by simply not realizing that the data you're using have some sort of specific characteristic um, that will be eventually picked up by the algorithm. And, and there was an example that I was reading about you know, the, um, okay, I, I won't be able to give you a reference right now, but I can um, search it if, if needed. So they, there was a, there was a team who was trying to develop an algorithm capable of predicting whether somebody was likely to be a criminal or not based on their um, complexions, uh, basically, and and their algorithm eventually came up with with something that was like if you, if your eyes are sort of 
um, how to put it? If the, you know, if the distance between your eyes is um, relatively small and your mouth is is narrow, you've got a small mouth. You're more likely to be a criminal than 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 otherwise. And I think this was eventually um, a highly disputed paper because the the data set they were using to train the the um, neural net was pictures of people. Some of these pictures represented people who had been, uh, you know, this, these were pictures from the police station of somebody who had been caught doing something they shouldn't have been doing, right? They were about to go to jail and pictures of people in their day-to-day -day life. And basically what this algorithm learned to do was to discriminate between people who were happy and people who were unhappy. And 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 then whereas the the the, the attribute so, so the the meaning that the the paper was giving to this analysis was well we now know how to discriminate between likely criminals and 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 non likely criminals so how how do you realize that you're inducing this type of biases in these models? Maybe instead of uh, answering or before answering, I, I add another similar situation. A colleague of mine was um, with a team of people designing some automated uh, pre-selection in some hiring for a big company. And uh, and then they realized that they were like, you know, uh, there was a huge bias in the sense that a certain, uh, let's say, race or ethnicity was uh, really biased against. And, and they realized because, you know, in the sample, then, then they, you know, likely they realized, right? So often you don't like in financially, probably if I see some evolution, unless it's really, I don't know, like, you know, it's constantly going up, it's difficult that you detect if you do market generation, that there is something strange, right? But and this was just inflated by the by the algorithm because you know in the data sample there was just a very small data about a specific like you know let's say gender, age, ethnicity, and so on. And then this was like you know let's say there was uh, a person that you know in the in, in the group which you know started doing a bad job or whatever. And this resulted in a huge bias, right? In big numbers, right? So I think. This is just, you know, a, a red uh, ticket. It's something that we say, okay, we need to pay attention uh, because, of course, if there is some bias in the data set or, you know, if in our implicit assumption, so this can really go to big scale. So the algorithm can really push this more. So, of course, it is not an answer to Tiana's uh, question, but it's more like putting on the plate uh, another similar problem. Uh, I don't know if anybody has a way. <laughs> I mean, we, we mentioned um, the potential importance or the increasing importance in future of testing um, algorithms, um, but we didn't we didn't say any we didn't say much more about, about that. You know, maybe, maybe it's worth just acknowledging actually that's that itself will take some careful thought and design, um, and maybe you know being really clear about what these what assumptions are being made will help us to design better tests. Future. So uh, I'm aware we're running out of time. I think there's one question, hopefully quickly, from from Richard in the audience. Yeah, I mean, just a comment. I mean, I think statisticians are actually quite good at, at understanding these problems. Um, we're talking about uh, sampling, uh, you know, at, at its root. Uh, what I tend to teach my students is about a general model. Um, first principles, bias, variance, in sample, out of sample, error, etc. That's really good at sort of catching um, a lot of uh, potential problems and, and actually explaining to them that you one has to be honest about the approach that, that one, one takes. And then just on classification problems in particular, if you have uh, a very small, uh, a very small sort of uh, group, that you're interested in, uh, where you do have unequal groups, you're going to get, you're going to, you know, you, it, it, it can, that is quite a difficult problem. And, and I suppose one follow up on that point is these are classical issues in statistics. Yeah. And what we need to push back against is this idea that somehow machine learning will fix this problem, which is not a technical problem of the learning. It's a problem with where are we getting our data from? And those problems are going to become bigger and bigger. The more we use passively collected data, which is from the wild, we're going to have to be more and more aware of what these biases are and think through these in some detail. And I think this is something that machine learning 
the machine learning community is going to rapidly learn mm. um, as they extend beyond beyond video processing into yeah. more and more application areas. Yeah. So having representative samples. So it's a a very basic statistical concept. Okay, so I'm aware we're running out of time. Um, perhaps, I mean, I don't know if the panel wants quickly to have any last words or any final statements they want to make. No? Okay, um, so in which case, I'd like to thank um, Sam, John, Beatrice, Blanca, um, and also fellow organisers, Tiziano, um, Katrin, Nick, for helping um, RSS for all their support and thank you all for coming and thanks all for all the great talks and discussion. Thank you very much to all um, the organizers. Thanks, yeah. Alex. Thanks, thank, you. thanks Alex. thank you.